Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Foreign Policy Centre and Justice for Journalists Foundation webinar. Today, we're discussing attacks on media workers in the post-Soviet region. And today's webinar really could not come at a better time. The decision to expel the BBC's Sarah Rainsford from Russia is arguably the most high profile recent example of the challenging environment facing media workers. But this is just one of many cases with Justice for Journalists own report showing 4,611 attacks against media workers in the post-Soviet region in 2020. And we know that this is a staggering increase. This challenging landscape is something which I am concerned about as the UK Labour's Shadow Europe Minister. And I've been raising consistently with our government on repeated occasions, my concern about what journalists are facing day by day. My brother is a journalist and um, I hear from him daily about the sort of challenges he has. And so I'm really pleased today to be chairing the session and to have such distinguished guests with us. We have um, the wonderful Maria Ojonikidze, Director of Justice for Journalists Foundation, Roman Dobrokotovov, Founder and Editor-in-Chief of The Insider, and Hannah Liubakova, the freelance journalist and researcher, and our own Sarah Clark, Head of Europe and Central Asia, Article 19. Now we're asking people on the webinar if they could please put questions in the Q&A function, and then these will be passed to our guests after they've spoken. And could I just thank everyone again for being here and thank you for your interest in the fundamental right to a free and independent media. So without further ado, could I ask Maria to please um, begin our session with her contribution. Yes, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for, for joining us. And thank you, Catherine, for your wonderful introduction. Uh, so my presentation today will uh, touch upon the situation with the media in the post-Soviet region. And uh, it will also set out a broader background for the consecutive contributions that provide more detailed personal accounts from Russia and Belarus. Uh, so firstly, I just will briefly introduce the Justice for Journalists Foundation's component of activities that has to do with the monitoring of the attacks against media workers. Uh, then after that, I will summarize the few general uh, trends observed over the last five years that have to do with the attacks against media workers in the post-Soviet space. And finally, I will sketch out uh, the threats journalists are facing in Belarus and Russia and hand over to the next presenters, uh, Roman and Hanna. Uh, so the Justice for Journalists Foundation's primary goal is to fund journalists who investigate the crimes against media workers. We also organize trainings and workshops and publish manuals in order to help journalists to acquire knowledge and skills to manage their risks and maximize their security. Uh, to help the journalists uh, assess uh, their particular regional risks, we have uh, created and uh, maintain the, um, just trying to share my screen here. Yes, so uh, we have created and, and maintain uh, the media risk map uh, covering the post-Soviet region. Uh, all published and verified attacks against media workers between 2017 and present day are introduced to the map on the daily basis. Uh, the findings are also summarized in our annual reports that are available on our website. Uh, so I would like to uh, introduce a few main findings from uh, this work. Um, and um, you can see here on the next um, slide, the kind of the general trend uh, that um, shows uh, the number of attacks uh, increasing uh, over the last four years. And this trend uh, unfortunately continues in 2021, but the final figures obviously will be available next year. Uh, this, uh, the, the sort of attack, the types of attacks uh, that are prevailing are uh, arrests. And you can see here the growth in between 2017 and, uh, and last year. And we're talking here about the um, 12 post-Soviet countries and uh, uh, regions like uh, Crimea uh, that are not countries. So these are uh, the other type of attackers, lawsuits and trials. Here we also see growth 
um, non-fatal physical assaults also increasing uh, all over the region and cyber attacks. Uh, again, this is something that, that is uh, considered by the majority of journalists and not just in the post-Soviet space as the um, kind of natural uh, trait of, of the work. So people do not necessarily report this kind of attacks. Therefore, the number is not uh, so high, but uh, here we also see uh, the increase um, in, in that type of attacks. Uh, all um, we could um, also see, which is uh, very important, I think, uh, that the main perpetrators, the initiators of the attacks against media workers uh, in countries like Azerbaijan, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Russia and Uzbekistan are primarily the representatives of, the, uh, of their forces. So you can see the dark blue um, part of the uh, chart. Uh, it um, shows how many, uh, what, what percentage uh, is uh, this, this type of attacks, um, the, the perpetrators were the, the authorities. Uh, although uh, not the most common, but one of the worrying punitive measures that I wanted to mention today, uh, again, that starts um, kind of gaining force against in, in this region uh, is the um, tried and tested Soviet anti-dissident method of forced incarceration in psychiatric institutions uh, of the media workers. And since 2017, um, Justice for Journalists has recorded 10 attacks of this type in Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Crimea, and Russia. Uh, also in the same uh, regions, uh, what we're witnessing is the um, uh, the, the subject, the, the the case of independent journalists who are being increasingly subjected to the systematic uh, persecution with the use of tools from two or more um, categories of assaults, so different types of assaults against the same journalists. Uh, again, same countries: uh, Azerbaijan, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Russia, and Uzbekistan practice systematic hybrid attacks against singled out journalists. Uh, using a variety of different types of persecution. As a result, media workers have been forced to quit the profession, emigrate, or even succumbing to uh, intolerable pressure, uh, take their own lives, as, as Russia's Irina Slavina, whose picture you can see here on the slide. Uh, she was subjected to many years of various uh, types of bullying and harassment and uh, took her own life uh, in Nizhny Novgorod uh, last year. Uh, another example of uh, a person, uh, an independent journalist who was subjected to uh, hybrid tax uh, is the Azerbaijani journalist Hadriji Ismailova. Uh, she was uh, threatened, harassed, attacked, and sent to prison for her work in pursuing the truth about Azerbaijani government. In 2011, after the publication of Panama Papers, a secret camera was installed into her house and videos recorded were used to blackmail her. Uh, and recently, uh, she was revealed to be one of the 180 journalists worldwide targeted by the infamous Pegasus software developed by uh, the NSO group. Uh, so the trend of gradual worsening uh, of the situation with the, with the media uh, is continuing uh, in 2021. And I wanted to mention a couple of examples um, where uh, we see a drastic decline of situation in Georgia uh, that was previously rather calm. Um, and um, there is obviously a correlation between the political change and, um, and, and the treatment of the media. Twice as many attacks took place in the first eight months of 2021 than in the whole of the previous year. There were 104 physical assaults alone, more than during the four preceding years taken together. And one uh, photojournalist, Alexander Lashkarova, uh, whose uh, picture you see here on the slide, uh, died as a result of brutal beatings and injuries received while photographing the attack on uh, LGBTQ uh, plus activists in Tbilisi in July last year. Uh, on the more optimistic note, Moldova, uh, that saw a democratic president elected last year, had seen just 22 attacks in 2021. Uh, which is three times lower than previous year, 2020. So I will say now a few words uh, as a means of uh, introduction to our uh, next two presentations about uh, Russia and uh, Belarus. Uh, overall, we can say that both countries have uh, decided to shed the remainder uh, of the democratic facade um, and uh, the pandemic, of course, was used to us as one of the excuses. Uh, 
so um, in Russia, the number of attacks uh, on professional and citizen journalists in 2020 exceeded the total aggregate quantity of attacks for the three previous years by a factor of two. Uh, the increase took place primarily on account of attacks by judicial and economic means. Eight journalists, eight Russian journalists died in 2020, including Irina Slavina, whom I mentioned already. Uh, uh, two Chechen bloggers, uh, independent bloggers were murdered, one in France, one in uh, Austrian uh, suburb. Uh, and also uh, it's worth mentioning uh, the Orenburg journalist, Alexander Tromachov, who died uh, one month shy of release from a penal colony after nine year term. In Belarus, uh, authority, they, they, I'm sorry, uh, still, still about Russia. So the, uh, in 2021, the Russian authorities have expanded the list of foreign agents and undesirable organizations by including more outlets and journalists. Currently, there are 47 entities and individuals in the foreign agency agent registry, 30 of which were added uh, this year, 2021. Uh, the other means of harassment of journalists include searches, seizures of personal belongings, documents and equipment, opening criminal cases on trumped up charges, and as ever, smear campaigns on the state-owned television channels. Uh, most prominent Russian language investigative and news outlets such as uh, Project, Medusa, uh, Open Media, uh, V Times, um, Dossier, um, The Insider, and others were, um, some of them are blocked uh, for the Russian internet users. Uh, some of them have been shut, forced to shut down or move abroad to continue their operations. And uh, as has already been mentioned, uh, BBC journalist Sarah Rainsport had her accreditation revo revoked after 20 years reporting from Moscow. Uh, following uh, in Belarus, uh, following the revolutionary events surrounding the elections of the president in, in, of the president in August 2020, uh, Belarus uh, became the record holder for the amount and cruelty of uh, reprisals against media workers. The overall quantity of recorded attacks increased nearly eight times compared to the previous year. Security personnel in the state service are the main danger for the media workers in Belarus. They were perpetrators in at least 91 instances of beatings and torture of journalists. Uh, Belarus belongs to those countries that practice systematic attacks of a hybrid nature. And the main targets in 2020 were 13 journalists whom the authorities were subjecting to a variety of different types of persecution throughout the course of the entire year. In 2020, they recorded 513 instances of deprivation and restriction of liberty of media workers over this year. Uh, in 2021, uh, the trend uh, continues and more and more media outlets and telegram channels uh, are being labeled extremists, uh, for which their owners and authors are subjected to the brutality of the state. Uh, in 2021, over 100 media workers were detained. At least 29 media workers are awaiting trial in detention centers or under house arrest. Uh, Belsat journalist Katerina Bak uh, Baklava or Andreeva Daria Chultsova, uh, whom you see on this um, uh, slide as well, are already serving their two year sentence in penal colony. The unprecedented scale level uh, of brutality and open disregard to the internationally accepted norms are the feature of today's Belarus persecution of independent voices. I will stop here and I will pass uh, the floor to Roman. Thank you. Yes, um, so well, I don't have a lot of to add actually because of this such a comprehensive um, explanation of what's happening uh, with Russian media. I would just um, add some concrete details of how I see it being uh, a Russian media manager. And um, uh, first of all, Maria said that we witness gradual um, trends on uh, uh, suppressing media freedoms in Russia, but I don't see it um, as very gradual. I think that there, there was uh, a pretty concrete time when um, the government made a very strong and uh, 
um, very big step on uh, um, taking our freedoms of speech. And that was, it was starting, I would say in uh, spring of this year, when uh, we saw a very different directions of how they are taking these freedoms. So first of all, uh, new uh, laws, laws against um, journalism that were uh, taken by Russian Duma. So it's uh, laws on additional laws on uh, foreign agents, uh, criminal, criminalizing some even kinds of journalism. For example, if you write about um, security services or uh, Ministry of Defense, now you can be um, you can be a called a foreign agent and be imprisoned in five years just because you publish some information on Russian security. So if you're just writing an articles on any other topic, that would be um, some administrative punishment of fines against you. And if you just don't pay these fines later, you will face this criminal uh, prosecution against you. But if you're writing about security services, as we are doing uh, in all the last years, that means that they can immediately open a criminal investigation against us. Um, so there were like a bunch of uh, laws that actually are so um, wide and blurred that any Russian journalist can immediately be uh, criminalized uh, without actually even real explanation why he is in this blacklist, because this is how Russian laws uh, work under Putin. So um, everybody can become a criminal and uh, Kremlin decides how these laws will be implemented and who will be punished and who will not. So, for example, all the propagandist media also um, can be punished as foreign agents because they all have foreign uh, money from advertising, for example, uh, but none of them were in the list of foreign agents. So, um, all these uh, new waves of laws were uh, coming into act in last months. And immediately we saw some other activity that actually has nothing to do with this uh, laws, uh, such as uh, FSB searches in uh, apartments of Russian investigative journalists. And all of these searches, when FSB came and took our computers, our cell phones, in my case, also foreign passports, uh, I mean, like travel passports, um, all of this had nothing to do with these new laws. It's all was about some very old libel cases. In, uh, in my situation, it was libel case about a tweet that I published a year ago. Uh, and uh, they saw uh, that like they need to investigate if there is uh, some defamation there. Uh, and on uh, this was an excuse for them to uh, take all the computers and passports. I don't know what they are going to look for in, in my passports, but they thought this is, this, uh, is important uh, to investigate my tweet. Um, and absolutely the same happened with uh, Roman Anin and Roman Badanin. For some reason, all of our investigative journalists are Romans. So they um, took also their computers, all their uh, disks, uh, just to uh, get some information about investigations. And all of this was because of some very, sometimes very old uh, libel investigations, like uh, in sometimes three or four years uh, ago, uh, there was some uh, libel case against um, Anin. He even worked in other media uh, at that time. The same with Badanin uh, also. So uh, they don't really need these new laws. They can just come and get everything they want, um, misusing the old laws. So we saw that it all started uh, immediately in this spring and with all the investigative um, media 
simultaneously. So it doesn't look like they just gradually coming after other and other media sources. It looks like the wars Putin's uh, green flag or green light on uh, starting coming after independent journalism simultaneously. So previously, all these 20 years, what they were doing mostly was uh, they tried to um, um, stop all the financing for independent journalism, pressing owners, sometimes managers uh, of this media. And actually, that was the first thing Putin did in his political life right after he um, after his inauguration, presidential inauguration, in several weeks, he arrested Gusinski, owner of uh, main independent uh, TV channel and TV. Um, so that was his, uh, what he was doing in last 20 years. But what we're seeing now is just that FSB is just coming after journalists one by one. And um, that is a very new situation. Um, also, what we will see in nearest future, I think in nearest months, is that they will also come after um, hosting companies um, and um, they will try to block uh, all the domain names of the independent media. That's they already starting um, with um, Khodorkovsky Media, for example, and with some other. Uh, websites so and th that I think will be continued massively in in Russian media sphere. So uh, this is for me it's not a great it's very very rapid changes that happened this year and possibly will be continued already this year, which are aimed in total closure of all the independent internet websites. So this is actually waging a war against independent journalism, and they will not stop until all the independent media would be inaccessible on Russian territory. Um, so in the end, what shall we do? I think uh, this war will be continued in technologies because they can't just imprison all the journalists. Many of them are already working abroad. Many of them are working anonymously. And we know that we even can get uh, reports uh, from countries like Turkmenistan, uh, that means that it's impossible totally closing, it's impossible to totally close uh, a country. Um, what they can do is to uh, deprive the ma big majority of Russian population from easy access to this information. So it's a technological issue and um, what we are trying to do is making everything possible to make it more difficult to close uh, this access, for example, using YouTube, using Telegram, and all the other means of delivering information. So I think this will be another better field for Russian ind independent media for next several months. Thank you. Hannah, I think you're speaking next. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, first of all, uh, hello everyone. Thank you for um, attending this amazing um, and very timely discussion. Um, so I am from Belarus and as a journalist from Belarus, I never felt uh, safe or I never felt welcome in my country. Um, but I think last year, a real war indeed has been launched against us and the situation has become really uh, well catastrophic in a way um, we were detained we were shot we um i think we might have an internet problem hannah you're back i think I'm back. Okay. Yes. Um, sorry. I think the connection here is not that good. I'm not in Belarus at the moment. Um, this is not because of Lukashenko. I think this is just because of my Wi-Fi. Sorry about that. 
Um, so last year we were uh, beaten, we were detained, we were tortured, we were jailed, and um, um, it made this the, the kind of the situation in Belarus for media workers as the most dangerous um, in Europe. And um, I'm currently in Kiev, where I arrived a few days ago, and there are. I think we've lost Hannah again. Um, we just wait a minute and see if she comes back. I think, you know, we just need to be patient. <laughs> if we have a long pause, Sarah, you might want to come in so that we can keep to time. No problem. Um, and, then, and then we can ask Hannah to come in. Sarah, why don't you start and sure. then Hannah can follow. Is that a good idea, Poppy and Adam? I think that's probably the best way to proceed. Oh, she's back. Hannah, you are back. Sorry about that. I'm just trying to connect via my phone. Um, uh, uh, why my hotspot? Anyways, uh, sorry about that connection. Uh, so I'm currently in Kiev, where I read a few days ago, and there are uh, here, only here, there are more than uh, 100 journalists at the moment. So they all had to flee Belarus most recently. And Kiev, Ukraine is just one direction. We have Georgia, we have uh, Warsaw, Poland, we have Lithuania. These are becoming new media centers for Belarusian journalists. Uh, those who have not been jailed yet are being pushed out of the country, and that's a really dangerous, that's a really um, worrying and really frustrating trend that, that, uh, that has been um, taking place um, since the past year. Uh, what is left in Belarus? I would say that only few, only a handful um, media outlets in the capital, national media outlets and in the regions, um, many of them, at least 100 websites have been banned. Nearly 200 telegram channels and chats were announced as extremists. And that's uh, kind of another trend that the regime is, uh, is currently adopting. So, so these uh, kind of social media um, uh, announced as extremists do not allow people to read them. People are scared to post information from those Telegram channels. Uh, many of them belong to mainstream media, which also means that those media are being announced as extremists and people just are scared to, to be interviewed by, by Belsa TV or by Tutbi Y and, and some other uh, kind of most important, most uh, vibrant media outlets in Belarus. Um, it does it, what, what does it mean in general for the society? Uh, the information is becoming more fragmented. People uh, have um, less kind of opportunity, less chance to get access to, to, to this information. I totally agree with Roman that it's just not possible to, to ban information from spreading in the 21st century, but Lukashenko is definitely making it, it very difficult. In eventually it will become, um, it will mean more polarized society because people just lost any ability kind of any platform for our communication um, and, and we need to recognize the urgency. However, at the same time, I still think, I still believe that there is a lot of hope for independent media in Belarus and for their future in the country. Firstly, uh, it's the trust and uh, popularity of independent media. Since the pandemic, people completely turned to independent journalists, independent bloggers, because uh, those were spreading real information, real facts about, um, about the pandemic, about the statistics, and that's kind of something that, that Belarusian were, um, were reading right about. The respect independent journalists, they were protecting us many times when we were um, uh, nearly um, arrested, they surrounded us, and when police arrived, like we were protected by, by those crowds of people. Um, they were letting us to the apartments. Now, I think a really important trend, which I also would like to highlight, is citizen journalism, which is becoming really important at this moment. Um, witnesses, citizens are just um, uh, kind of taking videos, uh, pictures, and so on, and send us. And then we, we report on those events because we cannot be in Belarus at the moment and report from 
from there. Um, another very important trend, I think, is that um, kind of the ability of journalists to self-organize, to revive their work. Our work has never been disrupted. We were pushed out of the country, uh, Nasha Niva, like who newsrooms? Nasha Niva, Belsa TV, uh, Tutbiy, um, uh, some of these journalists were jailed, but uh, then uh, dozens of them uh, fled and then re-established those media outlets abroad, from abroad. So I, I think that that kind of uh, strength um, of, of independent journalists will um, will never be in, um, um, it will never be shot, I think, by, by the regime. However, um, more should be done. And I think uh, here the West, uh, the UK in particular, could, could be really helpful. Firstly, uh, we need to uh, kind of save the media field. We need to save it as a really vibrant um, vibrant field that, that really helps citizens. Um, such projects, such kind of newsrooms at Tutbiy, uh, a new project, Zerkova, uh, Nasha Niva, and so on, want to be sustainable, but they cannot be at the moment so they need some financial support and they need some help with um, registration abroad um, here in ukraine um, it might be easy but then for example in the baltic states um, it's very difficult to open a bank account so so they have some kind of limitations there as well and they need support um, journalists who had to flee need um, grants for their own research for their own projects investigative projects very often but they also need some support with uh, relocation they need visa um, and they need relocation funds for the first months when, when they kind of relocate to, to another country. Journalists inside Belarus need legal support. They have to, uh, to pay a really um, um, high fines. They have to pay for their lawyers. Um, another problem, problem here is that it's really difficult to pass this money, so we need some um, flexible rules of how this money is being delivered to Belarus, for example, through cryptocurrency. And this is also something really urgent and something really important, which I would like to, uh, to, to highlight here. Um, bloggers and YouTubers, um, and I totally agree here with, with Roman, these are new formats, these are very creative formats, and this is really hard to, to ban in inside the country in Belarus, and that's something that the people really need right now, they feel hunger for that, and uh, often this um, kind of, um, well many often these are youngsters who launch these uh, YouTube channels and so on, they don't know how to get money, how to get funding, so, so uh, kind of huge foundation don't know them, so it's important to kind of connect them via uh, journalism organizations and so that they can get this funding. Um, in general, generally, I would say that it's really important, it's really urgent to preserve civil society and media because um, once the country is free and democratic and the change would, would definitely come in Belarus, um, we, we would not... Um, uh, I don't want to see the dessert. I don't just want to see an empty field. I think uh, if we preserve the structures, the country will, will be stronger and the change would uh, become more um, easier. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, our final speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Thank you, Catherine, and thank you to the speakers. Um, I just want to begin by really um, paying tribute to the extraordinary work of, of Rahman and Hannah and Maria. Um, I'm going to just um, focus my remarks on some of Article 19's work in Central Asia. Um, we do work across the region um, and we've you know, ob observed and followed and advocated around um, many of the issues that Hannah and Rahman um, and Maria have, have, have been raising. Um, Article 19 has an office in Bishkek uh, from which we monitor the situation of, of freedom of expression in the region. Um, and in particular, we're looking at the issue of freedom of expression online um, in the region. You can, you can tell from the remarks um, of, of my colleagues just how important the digital space is for um, expression and dissent and association um, and obviously as a result what we're seeing is really what we would call the rise of digital authoritarianism um, so this is you know the introduction of a range of laws um, criminalizing freedom of expression online um, but also 
um, targeting the you know dissenting websites through throttling and slowing down internet speed and of course of website blockings. Um, I wanted at the beginning just to, to, to mention the importance of justice for journalists concept of, of hybrid attacks. So, um, you know, what we are seeing is, of course, not just freedom of expression online being restricted. We see the culmination of legal, digital and physical attacks. Um, and we also see in particular, and Article 19 has done a lot of work on mapping how attacks online have a tendency to spill over um, and, 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 and lead into attacks um, in, in the real world. So particularly, we've seen this against female journalists, how um, you know, very intense online trolling can then lead to attacks both on, on female journalists um, and on their families. Um, in in the, looking at, at Central Asia um, and, and the, the five countries there, um, what we're seeing is, um, as Roman mentioned, you know, there's already, you know, while, the, while they're not homogenous, um, the, the, the trends that we see are um, existing old libel and defamation laws that remain on the books. And as, as Roman mentioned in, in the Russian context, uh, can be used at any point. So both criminal and, um, and civil defamation cases, um, you know, remain a, an ongoing um, Damocles sword hanging over most journalists um, in, in the region. Um, we then have existing um, counter extremism, counter terrorism and incitement laws, um, which are often used because of their extremely broad and vague uh, formulations are, are often used uh, to criminalize journalists, um, bloggers, academics, um, religious groups. Um, and this legislation has, has been adopted in, in many of the countries, um, I'm thinking of Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan in particular, it's adopted whole scale uh, from the Russian legislation. So we have this tendency of what we call sort of copycat behavior. Um, and this legislation remains a, a very serious and often used uh, tool against dissent. Um, and then, of course, the most recent legislation, um, which is that that's largely been passed in the context of coronavirus, um, which targets fake, fake news, um, disinformation and misinformation. Um, we saw this happen across the region um, during the pandemic. Um, again, you know, Russia really led the way with its own fake news uh, law. Um, and, and we have a lot of concern of, of how, you know, these laws will now be used in practice. Um, you know, and I think if we can look at, you know, Roman's um, presentation, um, we have a lot of concerns that further measures will be adopted in copycat behavior from, from what's happened in Russia in particular in, in the last um, four or five months. Um, in addition to all of this, as is, is very well documented in Justice for Journalists report, we've seen um, very serious crackdowns on protest um, in the context of the pandemic where uh, journalists were detained, uh, where journalists were stripped of accreditation, uh, where foreign journalists have been stripped of accreditation, um, for example, in Uzbekistan. Um, looking in particular at Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, I'm just going to talk a little bit about those, those two countries in, in the last year um, and, and, and to pick up on what Roman was talking about, really about the role of, of social media companies in all of this, because we, we agree that the, the main battle uh, ground at the moment is, is the war for, for um, uh, freedom of expression online. Um, in Tajikistan, uh, under uh, COVID or during COVID, um, we saw uh, the adoption of um, amendments to the Code of Administrative Offences, which vaguely prescribed the dissemination of false information. This was adopted in response to the publications of journalists, bloggers, and civic activists about COVID in infection cases um, and the unfair distribution of humanitarian assistance in the country. Um, you'll all remember that that the actual term COVID uh, was, was banned. Um, and so we saw 
what was already an extremely repressive uh, situation in Tajikistan has, has really become even more repressive. Um, in Kyrgyzstan, of course, we had the, um, the parliamentary elections in October 2020, uh, the Central Election Commission's decision to annul the results of, of that election. Um, and then, of course, we've, we've had a, you know, a huge uh, change in, in the administration there. Um, the protests that followed, you know, we saw uh, an enormous spike in the targeting of independent media and journalists um, alongside. So we had both online threats and the, the targeting of, of, of journalists through physical violence. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the rise of troll factories. Um, so Article 19 um, and our partners, the Media Policy Institute, have uh, we've published a report on on a on a case study actually on, on Foreign Policy Center's website, which I can uh, link to. Um, but this is a, a very interesting sort of in anatomy of how troll factories are, um, are are targeting independent journalists. Um, in particular for their reporting on corruption. Um, so, for example, in, in, in this instance, um, back in November of 2019, um, Radio Free Liberty, Radio Europe, um, uh, Re Radio Azatik, uh, and the OCCRP um, and its Kyrgyz member, uh, Klub, published a joint investigation into the widespread corruption of Kyrgyzstan's customs service. Um, what followed was an absolutely enormous coordinated attack on the journalists um, who, who published those stories online, um, in particular the female journalists. Um, so they were subjected to um, specific online um, threats, intimidation, insults, discreditation, um, doxing um, in, in a very, coordinated and really massive um, manner. Um, and and I'll, I'll share with you really, I think what was what was most difficult for us in that period as we were working with the journalists who were facing this harassment was the complete lack of response, both from the government, which we weren't really expecting a response from the government. In fact, the journalists said they, they, they didn't even want to report it to um, law enforcement agencies believing not only that their concerns wouldn't be addressed, but indeed that it would be counterproductive and could possibly result in further uh, reprisals. Um, but, but when we did um, advocacy with the social media companies, you know, these, th these troll attacks happened on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter. Um, and Article 19 does an enormous amount of advocacy with all of these social media companies. Um, we found it next to impossible to get responses from, from the social media companies. Um, and what it really brought up was, you know, some of the, the huge issues around um, lack of moderation in uh, Russian and Kyrgyz language content. Um, you know, that, that this online harassment has been left completely unchecked by the companies, um, despite, of course, their own um, policies, uh, you know, around community standards to challenge um, harassment and abuse. So, you know, we see that the, the social media companies ought to be playing a much more active role um, in preventing and addressing this, these forms of you know, increasingly coordinated um, online harassment. Um, and that's an area of work that we will continue to be to be pushing with the social media companies. Um, I think I just wanted to finish, you know, with a few points around advocacy and how we're responding um, in Central Asia to these issues. Um, Central Asian countries can be quite difficult to do advocacy on. Um, they're not members of the Council of Europe. As we know, the OSCE is not the most um, effective organization in applying pressure. Um, we do a lot of work with um, embassies in country um, to try to work through them to pressure um, host governments, you know, to improve their record on, on freedom of expression. Um, but we'd also use, you know, the, the opportunity of, of this event to 
look to the UK, which has diplomatic representation across Central Asia and, and has really um, committed to increasing um, some of its uh, representation there um, to be really using its commitments to media freedom, its, um, its global leadership as stated on, on media freedom to be pushing um, for much stronger responses um, from Central Asian countries um, in relation to the safety of journalists, online harassment, um, and of course their legal frameworks. Um, we are just a, a kind of a, a smaller note on, um, you know, where, where we are seeing, you know, some, some effective advocacy on some of the countries that Maria mentioned at the beginning, you know, through the Council of Europe, we have a platform for the safety of journalists. We do, um, monitor and report all attacks on journalists on that on that um on that platform um those those members of the council of europe so while we do have um the ability to have much more dialogue with countries such as georgia for example um those alerts on places like russia ukraine crimea azerbaijan um have really reached a, a total stalemate and and we have no response whatsoever from from the governments of Russia, Azerbaijan, Turkey, for example. Um, so we see, you know, I think a real breakdown in um, the efficacy of, of a lot of international institutions over these issues. And um, that's obviously in a much wider context of, of, of how the Council of Europe and other institutions are, are or are not working. Um, at this time, um, but as Article 19, we see it as, as you know, it's very important to maintain our advocacy at, at the UN and Council of Europe uh, levels, but but also with with social media companies. But there's obviously a a huge amount more to be done. Um, so we hope that both the UK government and, and others um, will indeed um, take a stronger uh, response as they have done, let's say, on, on, on Belarus. And um, we'd like to see that type of response on Central Asia as well. So I'll leave my comments there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. And thank you for giving us some practical ideas in the UK audience on how we can move forward on this. Um, and I'm really pleased to hear that um, you feel that compared to some of the other hotspots that the work that's been done on Belarus is a little bit more effective and has had some impact because obviously um, here in the UK we've met a number of um, uh, Belarusian nationals who live in the UK who are other students or who are based here who have quite effectively um, asked um, MPs to meet together. We have a really effective all party group led by um, one of our members of parliament from the Manchester area. Um, and we managed to get quite a lot into our foreign office questions around Belarus. But I noticed on the statistics which were put up um, in the first presentation, I think by Maria, um, if you look at the population of Belarus and the population of Russia, they're about the same number of um, attacks. So, you know, it's part of the reason that I think UK parliamentarians have been noticing Belarus is just that the intensity of the attacks is so huge. So um, it was really lovely to hear um, from Hannah and to have that personal perspective. Um, there are questions that we will now have. Just before we do that, could I just reiterate um, to people listening in the important work that was done by the Foreign Policy Centre um, I read both reports, the Tajikistan and the Kyrgyzstan report over the summer when I was actually in quarantine. It was very good reading for quarantine because they're nice long reports. Um, but they do go into a lot of detail about concerns. There's a lot of themes around violence against women and girls. Um, you know, very um, uh, egregious attacks on gay writers and journalists. Um, and, you know, that basically um, the response to the by the UK should be much more robust than what it is. Um, so I'm very pleased that Sarah has given us some tips as to where to go, for example, calling for the strengthening of the OSCE, which currently is not as effective as it could be, um, in enhancing the Council of Europe platform and using the data which we have from that platform. 
um, and also specifically post-Brexit, the UK, of course, it has all party groups for all of these countries, including, um, you know, Azerbaijan and Uzbekistan, every single area has an all party group. Um, and we should be putting pressure on our own UK diplomats to be um, talking about the areas of concern in a much more robust way. Um, because as Sarah mentioned, freedom of the press is one of the Foreign Office um, priorities. And um, certainly as Shadow Foreign Office um, members of Parliament, we do raise this on um, a regular basis. And it could well be a good topic for a backbench debate, which then gets it on the record in Hansard. So perhaps Sarah, later on, you and I could have a chat about approaching a backbench member who might be happy to bring that forward. We find particularly in the Belarus situation, because um, traditionally there has been some interface between our trade union movement and the workplace situation in Belarus, we have found that to be a really useful tool to speak to MPs here who are very interested in the workplace and how um, workers in the workplace in Belarus are finding it very difficult to enjoy any level of freedom. Um, and so we've found that for members of parliament here who happen to be linked in with trade unions that they are using that as their sort of comparator. Um, we've also noticed that in other parts of the world where we have really bad human rights situations such as Colombia um, and other areas, um, it's really good to work through the trade union movement because they have an international branch in many countries and they do um, have the capacity to raise really difficult um, and sensitive issues. Um, I wonder now, Poppy or Adam, whether we can move to the questions um, so that we can enhance what we can do here in the UK on human rights for um, observing the human rights of journalists. Yes, that, that would be great to move towards the questions and see if our attendees have any they'd like to ask our panelists. And please put them in the question and answer box uh, that you can see there. Um, obviously, the number of people have been commenting in the chat, um, but there is currently one uh, one question that is in the Q&A uh, box at the moment. Lovely. And while my panellists are looking at the box so that they can work out their answers to that, I thought I would also just highlight the point that was made regarding the role of the social media companies, because um, once again, um, both sides of the House of Commons do have an opportunity to question our Department of C Culture, Media and Sport, which has regular meetings with what we call the FANGs, um, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, and all of the different huge um, media empires, so that we have a really good opportunity um, to lay questions for our ministers on what they're doing to challenge not just English language trolls, but also to be challenging Russia language trolls, um, and also to be challenging our own government on the um, nature of the attacks, whether they are online or whether they're the legal or physical attacks. Um, so who would like to answer um, our first question? Would um, maybe Maria, would you like to kick off um, and maybe answer a couple of the questions um, in the chat and just reflect on what you feel has been, um, you know, the effect perhaps on the safety of women journalists, um, but also what you think we can do at a practical level here in the UK um, in, in order to raise some of these, um, you know, problems that, that, that journalists are facing on a day to day basis. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I think uh, it is, uh, you know, UK is doing already a lot to uh, tackle the uh, the problem of um, uh, the lack of security of journalists, uh, and that concerns uh, obviously first and foremost the the local journalists, the UK journalists, um, and um, there is a national uh, committee for security of journalists that that is um, regularly meeting and discussing uh, how um, law enforcement agencies can cooperate uh, with uh, uh, the NGOs and uh, the governmental officials to. Uh, tackle this kind of issues and to um, minimize the, the risks for journalists in the UK. So if uh, something uh, could be done to 
uh, kind of expand this model and uh, look not just at the um, in-country journalists, but those who are um, based in other countries and uh, look kind of more attentively into the methods that are being employed against journalists in these countries, uh, in these other countries. I think it will be uh, of utmost importance uh, because the, uh, the trends uh, seem to, um, to show that uh, the uh, perpetrators of the attacks, they uh, learn from each other. They kind of, they, uh, they implement the uh, same methods in different countries. As, and as we see in the post-Soviet space, um, you know, they're learning from each other. They, they look at, at what works and what doesn't work. Uh, like uh, Russia takes uh, several methods from Belarus or from Uzbekistan or from Tajikistan even. Uh, thankfully, not yet from Turkmenistan, but you know, the trend is clear. And unfortunately, those, those methods are being um, seen, uh, not regularly, but sometimes they're being seen in other countries like Germany, uh, like very much Poland and Hungary, uh, and sometimes in the UK as well. So I think it is extremely important to um, look out for those, uh, those trends and those methods and just pay more attention to what is going on. Uh, and possibly, even, even though uh, not much can be changed in this respect uh, without the change of the government, obviously, uh, but I think the, uh, the informed, uh, forming kind of informed view of what is going on and what methods are being used against the media is, uh, is of utmost importance uh, for the sake of the journalists uh, uh, in, in the UK and outside. Thank you, Marie. And Roman, could I ask you to reply to the question about Alexei Navalny, but also perhaps to give us as concerned um, British citizens and um, friends a little bit of an update on Alexei's current condition. Um, we have the Guardian which I, and the FT, which I read both every day. They have really good updates, but have you heard anything more that might be able to update us on his current health condition and, you know, what the lesson is there um, and any further assistance that you think we're able to offer? Yes, but uh, before uh, speaking about Navalny, I would just say um, one sentence about what British citizen can do to support media in Russia and Belarus. So I think that one of the important factors of survival of this kind of independent media is now financial sustainability. So um, most of our, at least in Russia, our independent media sources, they have their uh, uh, subscriptions, their crowdfunding campaigns. So anyone in any country who can donate at least, I don't know, 10 euro, 10 pounds or five pound, I don't know, uh, per month uh, to a media uh, can make a very important input into their survival. As we see at least um, several of our investigative um, and not only just independent media in Russia uh, survive mostly because of donations. Um, so this is, for, for some media, it's the only way how they can sustain themselves. So uh that's what i would suggest for all the people in other countries this is very important also it's very important because russian citizens sometimes uh, are afraid to donate to any independent media because the government started coming after uh the these people who donate for example to alexei navalny and they're afraid that this can happen also for the people who donate to media. So if it is like people who are living abroad, there is no risk for them. This will be very important. Uh, about Alexei Navalny. So uh, I don't really know a lot of, about his uh, health situation. I, I suggest it is mostly okay because uh, we still have connection uh, through his lawyers. And if something really bad happens with his health, I think that we would know this. Uh, he had uh, problems with his eyesight, he has some other health issues, but not nothing really that severe. Um, still, uh, I, I, I would uh, invite everyone still to um, speak about this situation as loud as you can, because uh, the fact that the person is in prison without doing anything wrong is still outrageous, and we, as uh, not just journalists or, I don't know, activists, just as uh, people who see this situation need to uh, 
speak about this because the worst that can happen is that everybody will just forget about this the fact that Navalny is in prison and just turn their attention to some, some other issues. That's the main nightmare that Navalny can have. So uh, speaking about uh, answering the question that I got about, oh, was it Navalny returning to Russia um, the explanation why government started coming after journalists. Uh, I think that there, Navalny can be effective here, but not uh, his returning to Russia, but the poisoning part, because uh, actually that was not the first attempt or by Vladimir Putin to kill Navalny. The first was in 2017, but we didn't know anything about this. And even Navalny didn't know anything about this. He just felt some symptoms in um, airplane, uh, it was during his presidential campaign. Actually, a lot of people, also some people in his headquarters, uh, felt the symptoms um, at some point in some year and just didn't understood that this was a poisoning. Actually, that's why Novichok is so effective. When you don't die, you sometimes don't understand uh, what's happening with you. So uh, we didn't know that actually the situation is so bad that actually Putin can try to kill his enemies like this. Of course, uh, there was uh, Politkovsky murder, there was uh, Nemtsov murder, but still it was presented as some Chechen story, so it was a little bit different. Um, but um, after Putin uh, changed constitution and decided to stay in power forever, it looks like he was ready to burn the bridges and uh, to kill uh, to make another attempt to kill his main enemy and um after this was discovered so it was at first uh, uh it was um proved by germany and other european countries that the po poison used was Novichok. it was already clear that it was kremlin staying behind this and after our investigation that uh, found concrete names and positions of fsb officers who um poisoned Navalny and we uh showed all the roots and um uh, like all, all all the facts how they plan planned it and everything uh it was it became so clear that uh Putin is guilty that um this was the mo moment actually when when the bridges were burned not, not when, when the poisoning happened but when all the world understood that it was the government, it was Putin who was standing behind this. So I think that this was a game changer. And uh, also it was a, a very big number of uh, investigations published in the end of last year. It was not only about Navalny, it was, was also about Putin's family, about his lovers and about um his assets about his links with criminal organizations and i remember that in the end of december even some people uh who were not supporting putin uh were like kind of independent watchers were wondering how can it be that russian media publish all such kind of important investigations simultaneously is it kind of a campaign or something they were trying to look for some conspiracy actually it was just the moment that there appeared so many independent media and it was end of the year you always want to publish anything before uh this long christmas holidays so it looked like a simultaneous campaign of this small independent internet um investigative uh, media and i think that putin really believed that this is a kind of western campaign against him so uh as long as he had already no reputation in the world after especially after this assassination of Navalny I think that was the point when he decided that like he has nothing to lose and he just better would get rid of independent media it is much easier than trying to restore his reputation um so yeah he he has nothing to lose he already is not viewed as a democratic leader by any country in the world so uh why wouldn't he uh uh try to close all these websites we were wondering for years why he's not doing this we had an example of turkey when he uh, at the gun closed uh 
uh, at least here in prison, thousands of activists and journalists, many of them, hundreds of them are still in prison and nothing happened. Like uh, we even don't speak about this uh, anymore. It's like part of new normality. So Putin just following Erdogan's steps um, uh, so I don't think that it is like that uh, Navalny returned to Russia. No, I think it's a part of a bigger picture. And we were waiting for this, we're expecting this. And I think it's only beginning. So uh, Putin will not stop before he will get rid of all the independent media and access to all this independent media in Russia. Thank you. And Hannah, do you have some reflections on how you feel we could be doing more as parliamentarians, but also in civic society to try and highlight the injustices and um, encourage governments like our own, but the European Union, um, the US um, and others to take more action, particularly, for example, you know, the use of our, um, you know, our trade arrangements, you'd be aware that our country is trying to obviously forge new um, arrangements following the Brexit vote. Um, what sort of action do you think we can take which might um, have a financial implication for the government? I know that you've been watching carefully with the BKN decision, which was actually partly members of parliament in the UK pushing for that. And we were successful in having that sanction introduced. But what is the next sort of campaign that you think we need to run for Belarus? Uh, well, thank you very much for your question. Absolutely. Well, this is not, I mean, the freedom of media is um, obviously more sort of a wider question. This is a, a, a question of generally freedoms in Belarus, and there, there are none at the moment. So we have to raise not only the um, kind of issue of uh, safety of the uh, repressions against journalists, but generally repressions against uh, basically everyone in Belarus, and the level of them has been, as you obviously know, unbelievable. Um, to stop repressions, more pressure is needed. Uh, we've been talking a lot about sanctions and the UK adopted, uh, well, in the beginning, the EU sanctions. Uh, now the UK is imposing its own sanctions in coordination with uh, Canada um, and, and, and other countries, US and, and, and so on. So this, uh, this is very powerful. This coordination, this unity is very important. Um, the last package that the UK uh, introduced, imposed, also targeted Mikhail Gutsuriev, who is a Russian oligarch, and he has been targeted for supporting Lukashenko, among other things. And this is uh, a very strong signal to other oligarchs in Russia who might do the same, who might use the political crisis in Belarus to buy out Belarusian um, um, economy and Belarusian uh, state-owned enterprises. So this signal, I think, to, to Russian oligarchs was important. Do not deal with Lukashenko, do not help him, do not support him. Um, and and I, I, would, I would consider kind of uh, suggest and I would recommend uh, considering in increasing sanctions packages. Uh, UK recently bought uh, timber from, from Belarus, and that's something that um, wood industry is pretty much controlled by the regime. So that's something that um, the, the UK might consider kind of not doing in the future. Um, obviously, access to financial markets is another very important issue. Um, the IMF most recently allocated um, almost 1 billion of SDRs uh, to, to Belarus. And here, I think uh, the UK might be kind of more vocal and, and, and um, um, bring the issue to the IMF uh, to, to sort of not to do this in the future and, and ban access uh, for Lukashenko to other financial markets. At the same time, we have also assistance, and this is something very important. We have to balance sanctions with this. Um, the EU announced a comprehensive plan for Belarus. This is 3 billion euros when the country is free. And here, uh, I think the UK might also consider um, announcing a, a similar uh, type of commitment because that's, well, 3 billion would not be enough, but also that's something that um, is very effective. It has a lot of, it creates a lot of dynamics in the, inside the country inside the elites, businessmen who are not necessarily very much loyal to Lukashenko, but they're scared to lose their benefits. And once they see that Lukashenko is not able to provide any solution to the crisis, they might look for some other solutions. 
the UK has immense power when it comes to international institutions, when it comes to the OSC, when it comes to the UN. Um, and this is where, uh, uh, or G20 or G7, right? So, so many of them. And here, um, UN Security Council, for example, right? So here, uh, the UK can also uh, act more and can raise the issue of Belarus and um, start launch um, the International Tribunal, for example, if it comes when it comes to the UN a Security Council. So, um, so some of these issues are important, and I think the kind of main strategy, the main goal of the position of the pro-democracy movement right now is to organize to hold negotiations and to do um, kind of everything as possible to. Uh, encouraged the representatives of the regime, not necessarily Lukashenko and the Kremlin, to take part in these negotiations. Uh, the opposition is working on this high-level conference to kind of invite foreign governments and so that the Kremlin would be more interested in, in the resolution of the crisis when the Kremlin sees that, oh, Western countries are deciding themselves, so I have, so we have to join as well and kind of uh, look, look for uh, for a solution. And generally, uh, one specific issue I think is how to keep focus. Um, I think the the BBC in London might open a um, a Belarus bureau, a Belarus office. Uh, there is only a Russian one, and uh, this kind of constant focus, constant at attention, keeps uh, helps uh, the. The, the, the people in Belarus to feel that they are not alone, but also helps decision making in the UK. And what the regime is doing, the regime is obviously killing the information from spreading, and that, that's something that uh, we cannot allow. It's a terrific list of things we can start working on. Um, if you had anything specific on the timber purchases, whether that was government or private companies or how that transaction occurred, if you could forward that through to my office um, and we can um, draft up another letter to Mr. Raab, who is the foreign secretary. Um, and also, you know, I'm very happy also to write to the BBC and ask them, um, you know, what assessment they've made of the possibility of a new BBC um, office in Minsk. So I think that would be, you know, a good place to start. Um, and I was really pleased that um, Mr. Gutsirev and the BKN did end up having the sanctions placed on them, not because I want ordinary people in Belarus to suffer, but because obviously we do need to get the government's attention and treating women journalists and journal any journalists in the way they have been is not okay. So I think that was sending a really, really strong message. And we had a lot of um, Belarusian um, nationals here last summer who said it was deeply upsetting to see that their country would be getting sanctioned on various things, but they felt on balance. It was the only strategic thing to do to try and stop um, the sort of corruption and the and the violence, yeah. Sarah, last comments over to you. If you could do us a nice um, sort of conclusion and some more suggestions. And Hina Gafur, who's in my office and is on our call now, is madly taking notes so that we can um, pull together some of these things and also help um, Labour MPs who are very concerned who want to kind of continue this work in a kind of a drip, drip, drip effect in the coming few months in Parliament. Yes, thanks. So I'd, I'd echo um, all of the recommendations made thus far. Um, I think something I wanted to add was, um, first is, is humanitarian visas. Um, that's something the UK could do. Um, it could do a lot more of, and I know the current climate for humanitarian and um, visas and asylum is is very hostile um, but there is a real need and this is for journalists who are persecuted um, across the board but it's it's an area that we've been doing a lot of advocacy that the high level panel on media freedom has an excellent report authored by Jan Yensu on the need for the UK and other um, you know global leading um, countries to uh, set the example in um, offering humanitarian assistance and um, both short and long-term visas uh, for journalists who are, are fleeing for their lives. Um, the second point I wanted to mention, which hasn't been raised thus far, but is the issue of uh, slaps or strategic litigation against public participation. Um, 
these are vexatious lawsuits, um, and this is an area that Foreign Policy Center, Justice for Journalists, Article 19, we've all been working on um, a lot over the last number of years. Um, but the role of London as a hub for libel tourism is an extremely important issue. Um, so we see um, a large number of cases taken often by oligarchs from places like Russia, um, Azerbaijan, um, and you know across the region. Um, they take libel cases against journalists from their country, not in their country, um, but in London, because of its plaintiff friendly libel laws, despite libel reform. Um, that, you know, there's a, an excellent report by um, Foreign Policy Center called Unsafe for Scrutiny. I'd, I'd really recommend um, the audience to look at that. So Poppy's just published it. Um, but that really details sort of how London accounts for the same amount of what we would call transnational or cross-border libel suits as the US and the rest of the EU combined. Um, so it poses a very serious threat um, to journalists. We know that journalists across the region are actually told that they should know London libel law as well as their own libel law, because it is the jurisdiction of choice. Um, and what we see is these are vexatious, meritless cases taken against journalists who are dragged through the London courts um, or who are simply threatened um, with libel action in, in the London courts. And um, even instituting libel proceedings can cost upwards of about £300,000. So you can see the huge financial threat that hangs over these journalists. Um, and this is facilitated by London law firms, London reputation management firms, and there's a big role for um, Parliament um, to address um, these, these issues. Um, we will be in the coming months, you know, looking at possible anti-slap legislation. Um, anti-slap legislation has been introduced with very um, effective results in, in a number of US states, in a number of Australian states. Um, we, we see there's a large coalition of, of, of actors working on this issue, and we would see that this is somewhere that the UK um, could act, and this could make a, a very um, practical and effective um, difference um, in terms of, of upholding media freedom and, and removing that threat that hangs over so many journalists, I'm sure. Uh, Roman Mayor, just to quickly come back on that, because I know you haven't finished, but just to say that um, Catherine Belton, who wrote the book about Putin, now she's being sued. Um, and it's an excellent book. And what's really good about that book is it's for lay people. So I read it, and I've been able to quote from it in Parliament. And it's got lots of sort of really fun facts. So you know, the million pound donation from Mr. Tomurko, um, and some of the others who, you know, he is actually an emigre and you know may well have had problems himself in Russia but you know the fact that he is still very much alive and businessman in that region suggests that he may still have links with the way that business is done in that part of the world which may not be clean money um, and also some of the um, other research that's been done um, where people have um, journalists or authors have been um, you know threatened with legal action um, we happen to, you know, have been able to link that with, um, you know, political donations here in the UK um, and the Russia report, which was um, a report to our parliament on um, some of the links from questionable um, financial arrangements in Russia and the countries around Russia um, may well be having an undue influence on some of our decision making in our government. And um, I think I've been able to very effectively um, use the research which Catherine Belton has done, which other FT journalists have done. Um, uh, and the journalists, even on you know newspapers like the Financial Times and the Guardian have been at risk of um, legislation and you know they get worried um, and quite rightly so. Um, and so I'm really, really welcome um, this anti-slaps um, push. And I think the other thing just to juxtapose it with is the fact that our own justice for um, British citizens at the moment is so compromised because of the funding cuts. And yet our courts are spending 
hundreds of hours on these ca cases and it just feels very very um, uh, sort of lacking in any balance around what your individual voter in the UK would want our justice system to be focusing on and court hours hours and hours of court hours on these sorts of you know I mean I include expensive divorces in that but obviously that's <laughs> a different category but I just feel as though now is the time for us to really try and get our justice system back um, and so I'm really pleased to hear that and I just had to interrupt you to tell you that <laughs> and to tell our listeners that but um, please carry on with other things you think we need to be doing. Thanks Catherine and um, yeah, well I think I think really just to, to tie it up is is you know to echo what, what Hannah and, and Roman and, and Maria have said about targeted sanctions um, we we need to see the UK. I mean, just talking about the UK, the UK has made a state of commitment that it is the global leader on media freedom. Um, the Media Freedom Coalition. Um, we we need the UK to really be um, implementing uh, its stated commitments, and um, that ranges from targeted sanctions, Magnitsky style, style sanctions on on those abusers of freedom of expression and media freedom, um, increased financial support. I mean, I think, you know, we can all see that the um, the cuts uh, to uh, foreign office and, and, and um, foreign aid has is affecting journalists around the world. And um, so to redouble their, their support of, of independent media and civil society um, to lead by example in addressing media freedom violations when they take place within the UK. I think we see particularly in, in Northern Ireland, we see a lot of um, harassment and, and threats of journalists um, that are not being properly investigated or, um, you know, we're not, we're not seeing the um, protection and, 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 and remedial action that, that's necessary. And then obviously in its own legislation, uh, we have an online harms bill going through at the moment. It's very important that, um, the amendments that are made to that that bill really uphold freedom of expression and, and media freedom. Um, likewise, with official secrets, you know, there's a number of really key pieces of legislation going through the courts, and we know that you know British law is 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 seen around the globe as as you know the highest standard and is also often ad ad adopted or referred to so so if there are very serious shortcomings um, in that legislation those two will be will be adopted and pointed to um by more repressive regimes so it's very important that that legislation is is uh, in line with international freedom of expression standards um, and then yeah a final plug for slap legislation reform Wonderful. Well, it's been a fantastic session this morning, and I'd like to thank all of our contributors. Um, we have got one or two minutes left. If Poppy or Adam want to say anything or promote any more of our um, work that is more strategic around reporting. Um, I know that the Tajikistan and the Kyrgyzstan reports um, were really well received by those of us who um, try and keep across the foreign policy challenges. Um, and there is huge support in the Women's Parliamentary Labour Party for um, the women of Belarus. And we've had, um, you know, a lot of, um, we've had a really good session with um, our chair of the Parliamentary Labour Party on that. Um, and I know that there's cross-party support for human rights um, as well. And, uh, you know, if there is anything specific that you feel we didn't cover, please email me directly. Um, and I will try and um, get the attention of our um, Foreign and Commonwealth Office on it. Um, I regularly write to Wendy Morton, who is my opposite number in the Foreign Office. Um, and I know that she has visited Russia. Um, I'm not sure what other um, countries that she's visited, but certainly um, I will make sure that I um, get these things onto her agenda so that we can try and keep pushing um, for freedom for journalists, for honest reporting, for facts, um, for people who live in a climate where it's so hard to get access to reliable information. Um, and we will certainly use the online harms bill as a vehicle to talk about our concerns around 
um, trolling and around um, the treatment of journalists um, on online platforms and how um, our, our um, media companies can be more of a force for good. So Adam, thank you so much for getting everybody on this call. It's been fantastic. Um, and obviously given me lots of fresh ideas because um, towards the end of last summer, I was thinking what's next on Belarus? Um, because we have had a lot of kind of support on that, which has been great. But Adam, if there is anything that you would like to add that you would like to kind of, um, you know, like us to pursue in Parliament, do let us know. It's coming up to conference too, which is a really good time to approach MPs from any party and to try and have their political parties discuss the issues and try and get, you know, more coverage um, of these really important matters. Well, thank you so much, Catherine. Um for your chairing today and for your uh, very kind words uh, about some of the work that we've been doing recently. Uh, there will be more work coming out in the Unsafe for Scrutiny project um, that we are doing um, with the kind support of Justice for Journalists about SLAPs, uh, which is obviously one of the key issues, and thank you to Sarah for, for raising that today, and we'll, there'll be much more going on through the autumn uh, on that. Um, we will also be launching the translations of our some of our work on Central Asia that Catherine was also very kindly talking about with the translation of the uh, Tajikistan report into Russian and the Kazakhstan publication into Kazakh uh, coming out later this month um, uh, as well. So um, we um, please do, if you haven't already signed up to the FPC's uh, mailing list to get our information about all of our events. Um, but um, without further ado, I will thank uh, Catherine, Sarah, Hannah, Roman and Maria uh, for speaking today and Maria and Justice for Journalists for uh, as ever being great partners in delivering this kind of work. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>